1915. Uh, his foray into organized crime began in the 1930s, and his specific abilities allowed him to control loan sharking, extortion, and narcotics trafficking. Uh, he started with the Gagliano crime family, which was the forerunner, obviously, to the Lucchese crime family. He also was another guy who got his early start in the 107th Street Gang. Lots of guys come from that gang. Uh, according to many sources, he was made sometime in the 1940s. On July 6th of 1942, he would be sentenced to six months to two years in federal prison for pleading guilty uh, for attempting to import drugs from Mexico. So, Marco, there's your answer to the Mexico thing. In 1951, Santoro would be indicted on conspiracy charges stemming from importing opium from Mexico and wanting to turn the opium paste into heroin. Santoro would go into hiding and fled the United States for Europe for a while before returning to New York City and turning himself in. September 24th of 1951, he officially surrendered to the feds. January 7th of 1952, he would plead guilty to those charges and would get sentenced to four years in prison. After that release from prison, he would be elevated to a capo. Uh, another interesting facet of Santoro was his ability to control and operate prostitution rings. And he specifically did this in the early days directly for Tommy Lucchese. He was Lucchese's guy for a lot of different facets of organized crime. Santoro, uh, excuse me, Santoro would operate out of East Harlem in the Bronx and really comes into his own in the 1950s. In 1959, he takes a serious pinch with his partnership with Bumpy Johnson, of all people, uh, which we obviously know was a narcotics operation. Santoro would be released from prison in 1978 and would be elevated to underboss and controlled the entire family's operations in the Bronx. Uh, when Santoro is released from prison, uh, he pushes the narcotics shit out, out to the side, doesn't deal with it anymore, and instead what he does is he relies on labor racketeering and construction racketeering. Uh, he would become the Lucchese crime family front man in dealing with construction rackets in the city, and he became incredibly powerful on his own. Uh, Christy Tikfunari was born in New York City in 1924. Uh, not a lot is known about him other than he quit school at a young age, and by 15 years old, he was already loan sharking in New Jersey and Brooklyn, New York. Imagine that at 15 years old. You're loan sharking. <laughs> At 15, most people at 15 start working at fucking McDonald's or whatever the fuck, or Burger King, whatever, Wendy's, whatever the fuck. This guy was loan sharking, loan sharking and shaking motherfuckers down in Brooklyn and in New York, or excuse me, in Brooklyn and in New Jersey. That's crazy, right? A 15 year old can't even drive. <laughs> oh, by 1943 at age 19, he had already done two stints in prison for armed robbery. So as you can see. Sort of from out of the gate, he was going to be a career criminal. However, there is something kind of disgusting we need to discuss. Uh, when he was 16 years old, he would be arrested and convicted for the gang rape of a 16-year-old girl in which he basically raped her with several other people and basically left her on the side of a mud hill, a mud, a muddy road in uh, New Jersey. Uh, for that, he received a 15 to 30-year sentence. Uh, and over the years, listen, there's been a lot of discussion about Christy Tick and about those particular set of charges. Some people say he never did that, that he was framed. Some say he did. Uh, I personally don't know what the truth is, uh, but the mob typically handles those types of guys a certain kind of way who do that. So I, I don't know the veracity of the entire thing. I just think that those charges are fucking vulgar and disgusting. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened, but that's a real fucking vile thing to do. Uh, in any event, Funari doesn't get out of prison until 1956. So he did a ton of time, a ton of time. Uh, through Tony Ducks, he becomes affiliated deeper with the Lucchese crime family. As we said, through the 1950s, he gets involved in heroin trafficking, gambling, and loan sharking. His profits begin to skyrocket, and he starts pulling in $25,000 a day. $25,000 a day through his various rackets in Brooklyn. He was officially inducted... Probably, I believe it was 1962 or 1963. He was probably 38, 39 years old. Uh, a year later, after he's inducted in, into the Lucchese crime family, he is made a captain within the family because he gets elevated because he's powerful, he's brutal, and he makes a shitload of money. So there you go. Uh, historically, okay, uh, the Lucchese crime family controlled the Bronx. That's history. That's where they've always been. Uh, it was the stomping ground for Tommy Reyna. It was the stomping ground for Tommy Lucchese. 
uh, or excuse me, Tommy Gagliano, um, Tommy Lucchese, uh, and Christy Tikfunari moves deep inside of Brooklyn, which is not something that the Lucchese's tip is typically ran. So he moves his operations into Brooklyn. Uh, Fanari would operate a crew based out of Bensonhurst and would operate out of the 19th hole uh, social club. It was a bar and a social club that uh, Christy Tick Funari controlled. His crew would operate in loan sharking, extortion, burglary, narcotics, and murder contracts. Uh, we know a few of the members of that crew, <laughs> Gas Pipe, Vicka Musso, and they were no joke. Uh, as Funari hit the streets, he moves deep into the labor unions, which is sort of the Lucchese crime family modus operandi. Uh, he would take over New York District Council 9, which represented over 6,000 workers who painted and decorated hotels, bridges, and subway stations throughout the city. Uh, Funari would manage that council through the union secretary and treasurer, Jimmy Bishop, uh, and his associate, Frank Arnold. Funari arranged it so that Bishop and Arnold would pick up cash payments from mob-owned contractors who charged 10 to 15% tax on all major commercial painting jobs, and he would pass those payments on to Christy Tick. Uh, one of the more unique things is that Christy Tick Funari, while you know pretty much obsolete with the Lucchese's, he had no problem conducting business with other families uh, and often used the 19th Hall Social Club to be the meeting ground for all five families to talk about different crimes and for them to conduct business. It's not something that everybody did. Uh, most would shy away from conducting businesses, uh, business with other crime families in general, and some would not do that where people could overhear them because, let's be honest, you know, you're going to kick up to your captain, your boss. You want to hide a little bit of that money of how much you're really making because everybody needs a nest egg, right? So it's the same, same sort of thing. Uh, but Fanari didn't really give a fuck. Business was business. Uh, in the mid-1960s, Anthony Gaspipe Casso and Vicka Musso would become members of Funari's crew. Both were high earners uh, and had the, the capability to murder without a problem. And it was Christy Tick Funari who taught Gaspipe Casso and Vicka Musso how to dismember bodies. Uh, in the 1970s, the books would officially open again, and Vicka Musso and Anthony Gaspipe Casso would officially become inducted members of the Lucchese crime family, sponsored by their captain, Christy Tick Funari. Uh, it's at this time the bypass gang would be formed, and Amuso and Castle, along with Funari, would form a gang who would become one of the most notable burglary rings in the city. According to the FBI, they stole hundreds of millions of dollars in cash, jewelry, and merchandise. And we will talk a lot more in depth about Anthony Gaspipe Castle and Vic Amuso next week, so don't think I'm skipping that. In any event, we know that uh, Funari becomes insanely powerful, but what he didn't know uh, was that his boss, the leader of the family, was being caught talking openly in his own car, on his cell phone, and just in his car in general, which would lead to a huge, huge problem. Uh, in 1983, the United States government began looking into corruption within the labor unions and more specifically into the construction and labor issues in New York City. Now, based on several factors, also including confidential informants and rats, uh, the FBI gets a grant to install wiretaps. Some of the information, albeit was obtained by Rudy Giuliani, did come from Joe Bonanno's book, but it also came from uh, Bill Bonanno, who, while he was serving time in Altoona, gave up information about the mob and other crime families in New York. Uh, he also gave up further sort of dissertations on how the structure and some of the players, and that would conclude a meeting uh, between uh, you know, Giuliani and, and Bonanno. Uh, Giuliano, uh, Giuliani also spo spoke to uh, Joe Bonanno as well, okay? Uh, and that sort of put the mechanics in place for Rudy Giuliani to seek charges against what Bonanno called the commission. Up until that point, the government alleged that they didn't know that there was a functioning commission, but I think they kind of knew. They just had nothing to sort of um, prove it. There have long, long been rumors uh, of the Columbo's um, running labor unions and construction rackets, it, because, and, and that's the point I'm trying to make is it along everybody knew the Columbo's were running labor unions and rackets and and and, and you know union stuff, um, and and I think the reality is the government kind of knew about it, but I think it's more likely that somebody would drop a dime on Ralph Scopo who was truly one of the most prolific construction racketeers in the history of the mob. Uh, in any event, the feds get a tip on Scopo, so they wiretap Scopo. And then what they end up finding out is that Scopo was essentially shaking down contractors 
They would either pay up at inflated prices or Scopo would ensure that there was a labor strike or murder if that's what he needed to do. Uh, Scopo at the time was the president of the Cement and Concrete Workers Union District Council of the Laborers International Union of North America, and he was that chapter president from uh, 1977 until April of 1985, which is a hell of a fucking run. So during that time, Scopo used his position to extort money from concrete uh, contractors in New York in return for large sums sums of contracts and labor peace. Any contracts between 2 and $15 million were reserved for a club of contractors called the Concrete Club. The commission selected which members controlled which areas and what portions and which contracts were handed out. In other words, mob bosses were picked for certain areas, for certain jobs, and more. In return... Those contractors, i.e. or mafia bosses, would pay 2% kickback of the contract to the commission. So in other words, we're going to give you X, Y, and Z contract. You're basically going to pay 2% of that total value to us. So in other words, they're buying shit, okay? Uh, they're paying 2% of the total contract to control it and gain money from it. It's like buying part. And this is this is excellent. I, I love my, my sort of analogy here. It's like buying Park Place and Monopoly. And it's like buying Park Place from the bank after it's been mortgaged. Think about the Concrete Club in terms of the entire board of Monopoly. You can buy cheap, and then you can spend money building your little greenhouses and your little fucking red hotels. You're still paying for it, but you're paying for it at a reduced rate, and the bank controls the unions and the workers and the people who are going to build for you, if that makes sense. Uh, the commission would designate certain men to oversee different facets of the operation. For the Columbos, uh, Jerry Langello would control various labor unions to ensure that there was labor peace and no problems. And he also looked out for the Colombo stake within the club. Uh, he specifically controlled the Cement and Concrete Workers Union District Council Local 6A. So you're controlling the unions, you're controlling what happens with your family. Uh, for the Lucchese's, it was Salvatore Tom Mick Santoro who controlled their part of the club. For the Genovese crime family, it was Tony Salerno who would control what went on with their uh, crime family. And he did it through sub, con sub uh, contracting companies called SNA Concrete Company and Transit, Transit Mix Concrete Corporation. So Giuliani had the information, but the information, you know, he had little information, but the information just kept coming. There was a guy by the name of Ronald Kubeka, who was a rival of Tony Ducks in Suffolk County in Long Island. And when I say rival, I mean simply that he was a rival in the garbage hauling business. He was the one holdout that couldn't be shook down. Um, Corolla had long established a firm grip over gravel uh, distribution and, and garbage hauling. And, and Kubeka was really the last holdout who refused to bend to Corolla's wishes and demands since the 1970s. This is the one asshole who was like the thorn in the side of Tony Ducks. Uh, Kubeka historically had been harassed by members of the mob and, and not just the Lucchese's, but a lot of different gangsters and not just Tony Ducks Corallo. His trucks were set on fire. His dispatch center was set on fire. And he finally gets to the point where he's exacerbated by the whole entire fucking thing. And he runs to the New York State Police who referred him to the New York State Police Organized Crime Task Force. And he begins to spill his fucking guts. Fucking rat. Anyway. They would end up putting a wire on him, and his job basically was get to get Sal Avellino to impugn himself on tape, as Avellino was the guy, uh, the go-to guy for the garbage hauling industry on behalf of Tony Ducks. A few months go by, Kubeka really couldn't get close to Avellino. Avellino was a little bit smarter than Kubeka, uh, but in doing his sort of rat work, he was able to obtain other information from other people that the feds could use to take to a federal judge to get more wiretaps. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, the feds would then get uh, you know, enough information to get in front of a judge, and they installed a wiretap on Sal Avellino's home phone. The problem for the feds was that uh, Sal Avellino rarely spoke on his phone. But the one item that they did get from months and months and months of a wiretap is that Sal Avellino spent most of his days driving around the alleged boss of the Lucchese crime family, Tony Ducks Corallo. And they know that because in one recorded phone conversation, he was complaining about having to drive into the city every day. So it was then, once they find out that he's driving Tony Ducks around all fucking day long, that the New York State Organized Crime Task Force begins to follow Tony Ducks Corolla around town all over the place. 
Uh, they had a few problems, though. They couldn't just follow him and, you know, expect to get, you know, anything worthwhile out of it. So what they had to do is they somehow had to get an electronic monitoring device and a GPS unit on Tony Duck's Jaguar. Okay, so they followed the car for a couple more months. And then on March 8th of 1983, the car would pull into a lot near a townhouse. Uh, inside, there was a private sanitation meeting that was going on. It was a sanitation meeting and a dinner and a dance. Uh, Sal Avellino would pull into the lot. He would park the car and he goes inside. Um, the New York City Organized Crime Task Force was watching very closely. Three agents would uh, wait until the guards and sort of the people just monitoring the lot kind of walked away. And three of these agents would scale the fence. They would use lock picks to gain entrance inside of the Jaguar. And they slightly opened the door just enough and then depressed the light button with their finger so that the car would not be illuminated because that would draw our attention. So for the next 50 minutes, 50 fucking minutes, they dismantled the whole entire inside of the fucking car. Um, they disassembled the dashboard and they would place a wiretap inside of the car. Uh, the agents for a month prior to this event had practiced on an identical Jaguar, same make, same model, same year, all of that. So they were proficient in dismantling everything and putting it back together. How the fuck they sat there for 50 minutes in the fucking dark and did this without being noticed is beyond my understanding. Uh, so once they did that, they shut the door. They went back over the fence and they were hoping to God that the bug would work. A few hours later, they realized the bug, in fact, is working as they could hear Sal Alvolino singing a 1980s song. I wish I knew what the song was, but singing a song in the car as he drove home. From that day on, they would listen to a tandem of uh, they would uh, use a tandem of five surveillance cars to listen to Sal Alvolino and Tony Ducks discuss everything from drugs to Joe Bonanno being a piece of shit fucking rat to the inner workings of the Lucchese crime family, to the hierarchy, to the structure and the existence of the commission, and dozens and dozens of grievances that Tony Dux Corallo had in regards to Paul Castellano, who he felt was robbing the rest of the bosses. Because apparently Paul Castellano had a better percentage than everybody else, and a lot of other bosses were pissed off about it. Uh, from those tapes, the government was able to double down on the commission, the relationships within the commission the structure of other crime families, the hierarchy of other crime families, the bosses of other crime families, and everything else in between, including how the Lucchese crime family operated in the unions and how the concrete club functioned in its fucking totality. For two years, the government listened as Tony Ducks buried himself, four other crime families, and hundreds of guys. As a result of those tapes, combined with the information given to Rudy Giuliani from the Joe Bonanno and Bill Bonanno, uh, also from information from informants, a bomb drops on February 25th of 1985. Nine mafia leaders would be indicted on narcotics trafficking, loan sharking, gambling, extortion, uh, and then further extortion against construction companies and labor racketeering. Here is a list of those who were indicted and what family they were with. Anthony Salerno, the Genovese crime family. Tony Dux Corallo, the Lucchese crime family. Salvatore Tom Mixantoro, the Lucchese crime family. Christy Ticfunari, the Lucchese crime family. Carmine Persico, the Colombo crime family. Uh, Gennaro Jerry Lan Lang Langella, the Colombo crime family. Ralph Scopo, Colombo crime family. Bruno and Delicato, Bonanno crime family. Paul Castellano, the Gambino crime family. Neil Della Croce, the Gambino crime family. Philip Rusty Rustelli, the Bonanno crime family. Stefano Canone, the Bonanno crime family. Charges, as we know, would be dropped against uh, Rusty Rustelli because the Bonanos had been kicked off the commission as a result of the whole Donnie Brasco bullshit. Uh, Della Croce, would obviously die before trial, so they couldn't charge him. Paul Castellano would get whacked before that trial, so he couldn't be uh, charged. But every single one of them was found guilty. And here are the sentences. Also, in addition, uh, Christy Tick Funari in a secondary charge, which charged with the murder of Carmine Galante, as was the rest of the commission for sanctioning the murder of Carmine Galante. However, Funari was not charged uh to be on the commission at the time, but was charged anyway. So that's what's really strange about the Christy Tickfonari charge is they charged the entire commission, okay, with the murder of Carmine Galante. However, it's proven that Funari was not on the commission. He wasn't a boss. 
So therefore, he shouldn't have been levied with that murder charge, but the feds do whatever the fuck they want. And that's what they've always done. Uh, and it's almost similar to the government, how they knew Tony Salerno wasn't the boss because wiretaps proved that Tony Salerno wasn't the boss. And then mob informant Vinny the Fish Cafaro testified a couple of months after Salerno was convicted that Salerno was in fact not the boss, but Vincent the Chin Gigante was actually the boss. So once again, the feds do whatever the fuck they want. So here are the sentences. Tony Salerno, 100 years in federal prison, $240,000 fine. Tony Ducks, 100 years, $240,000 fine. Salvatore Santoro, 100 years, $250,000 fine. Christy Tickfunari, 100 years, $240,000 fine. Christy Tickfunari, however, would get out of prison. He's dead now, but he lived to his, in, until his 90s. Uh, Carmine Persico, 100 years in federal prison, $240,000 fine. Jerry Langella, 100 years, $240,000 fine. Ralph Scopo, 100 years, $240,000 fine. Bruno and Delicato, 40 years, $50,000 fine. Bruno, Bruno and Delicato, right now, is in a halfway house. He's about to get out. So, uh, Tony Carallo, you know, he buried himself. But he was also complicit in burying the heads of the five families by talking so openly in his car. He details and in, in, in his complaints lead to his own demise. Everything that he had learned growing up in the mafia, for all the things he was good at, like following the structure set before him by Tommy Reyna, then Tommy Gagliano, then to Tommy Lucchese, to the insights of working within the trenches in the labor unions with Johnny Dio and Jimmy Hoffa. The one thing that could undo it all was overexpansion, greed, and his own mouth. And there's a lesson to be learned from this. While Tony Ducks in many ways carried on the legacy of those before him, he did one thing that those before him never did. They were comfortable with what they had established, pushing ever so slightly forward without going overboard. Tony Ducks sailed right into the fucking hurricane, into the fucking storm, and didn't give a fuck how big the waves were how harsh the wind was. And that was a huge fucking mistake. Tony Dex Corallo would die in prison in 2000 uh, at the medical center in Springfield, Missouri at age 87. While his career was long and it was notable and filled with a lot of different accolades, at least from a, albeit a street perspective, he did the one thing that you shouldn't do. And that's believe everything that you say isn't and cannot be heard. He buried himself, he buried the family, he buried four other families. If he never opens his mouth, does the government have the ability to get every single one of them? Well, based on a lot of the evidence in the case, yeah, they still had a pretty good credible case, but it would have been a lengthy trial, but they might have had a better chance. But there was so much about that trial that was fucked up, including Carmine Persico acting as his own defense attorney, <laughs> which drove everybody fucking nuts. And that made a huge headache for the mafia. For Tony Ducks, it was a horrible mistake. One that he would have to live with the rest of his fucking life in a cell. But it also altered the course of history. Because what begins to take root after his conviction is nothing short of callous and fucking berserk. And out of control. And that ushers in the era of Anthony Gaspipe Casso and Vicka Musso who, as far as I'm concerned, is like having two fucking Nicky Scarfos high on angel dust running around South Philly. <laughs> One was bad enough. Two of these motherfuckers is something altogether different. And it's going to usher in some serious fucking times, not just for the city of New York, but for the whole entire mafia who are still reeling from that commission case. And it's going to usher in one of the bloodiest gangland times in the history of organized crime in new york city especially in the 1980s and it's going to be the rise of anthony casso vicka musso the rise of john Gotti, and the rise of joey messino and so that's where we're going to leave the show today because it's going to get real fucking bloody and, and gory and disgusting next week and i hope everybody has enjoyed the Lucchese stuff, because you can learn things. And, and this is this is this is a final point I'm going to make. And this is why I enjoy what I do. 
is that every time I do this, I learn something different. And you always have to learn from your predecessors the mistakes they made. You don't commit. You don't, you don't make them same mistakes. But you can see up and down the line, especially the trajectory of the Lucchese crime family, that everybody from Gagliano to Lucchese to Carmine Tremonti sort of stayed in line. They didn't push too far. But that wasn't enough for Tony Ducks. In his early days, fantastic. Not, a, not, a, not, a, not an asterisk on his resume. But the minute that he gets that fucking title, he just pushes too far. The politics become a little bit much. And that's not to say that that's a negative attribute of who Tony Ducks was in totality. But it just shows you the impetus for having maybe too much power. And maybe not wielding it the best way possible. And listen, guys make mistakes. Nobody's perfect, right? But you look at the Lucchese history, and that's one of the most impressive histories, I think, of all the crime families. Honestly, like like we look at the longevity and, and, and how the Gambino crime family began, and that's interesting. But the Lucchese is just, it seems like they just stuck in a holding pattern. This is what works. Let's keep going with it. And the Genovese crime family has done the same since Vinny the Chin. They have stayed in line and done the same things. What works for one guy can work for another. But you always have to evolve and you always have to sort of maneuver and you can't get sloppy. You can't get lazy. When you do, that's when you get caught and the whole fucking thing comes crumbling down. And so in final, the things that I said off the first break, I mean, loyalty is everything to me. I don't hate anybody that I mentioned. I don't. I'm just not going to indulge in it. I'm not going to be a part of it. This is what I like to do. I like to talk about the history. It's fun. I enjoy it. It's thrilling to me. And I hope all of you are getting something from it. I hope you're learning. If I'm teaching you anything, it's what not to do, right? And so for anybody that may be offended for what I said off the first break, I'm entitled to be hurt. I'm entitled to be frustrated. I'm entitled to not like how I was treated. But that doesn't make any of the people I discussed a piece of shit. It doesn't make them horrible, awful human beings either. That's the thing about life. That's the thing about being human. We all make mistakes. We all sometimes get a little lost in the clouds. And it's okay. We're human. It happens. But sometimes people have to be a little more cognizant of what they're doing. Because I don't believe that anybody is blind to that sort of stuff. And I think that sometimes people like deer get caught in the headlights and don't know what to do. And an apology goes a long way. An apology goes a long way with me. But nobody's made an effort to do that. And so when I said that I wouldn't listen to this person show or that person show, it wasn't, it wasn't a vindictive, I'm mad at you, so I'm not going to listen to your show. But I am not going to support a show that puts people on that lie and say awful things about people. And never mind what they say about anybody else, but it's what they said about me. That's what I have a beef with. But like my show, and I will say the same thing because there will bound to be somebody who says this to me. Well, you've done this. Of course, I'm not trying to say I'm not. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I'm not trying to say I haven't done things in my life that are bad. But the one thing that I've always strive, stri really strived hard to do, really tried hard to do, and it's unfortunate. And oftentimes, I'm better friends to people than they ever are to me. And so there comes a point in your life where you put your foot down and say, all right, that's the way you want to handle things, and that's, that's the way you want to act. Okay, then I don't have to be a part of it. And that's the choice that I get. The choice I get, and, and this goes for everybody, I want to give you good advice about toxicity and about toxic people. You don't owe them anything. It doesn't matter how long you've known them. If, the, if they're bringing the dead fish to your dinner table, why do you keep allowing it? Just don't cut them off. Anybody that brings drama to your table, cut them off. Say, you know what? I appreciate what you're having to say, but I have my own life and me living inside of your bubble with your drama is not something I want to do. But you can support somebody and still be their friend and not indulge that. 
But when it's not reciprocated to you, because nine times out of 10, this is how it goes. You listen to one person's problem all the time, and then suddenly they have this epiphany where they're happy again, and you don't hear from them no more. And then when you pick up the phone to tell them what your problem is, they're busy. They don't want to hear it. Instead, they just lop more bullshit onto your plate. Stay away from people like that. Those are people that are selfish and only care about themselves and their goals and their ambitions and what they want to do. Don't be that person. Value people who value you. And that's the God's honest truth. We'll be back next week on Mob Talk. I just have to pull this up really quick. Uh, like I said, we're going to do probably eight eight of these and, and we'll be done. Um, and I hope you guys have uh, enjoyed it. I know I have. I've learned a lot. That's the unique thing about what I do is I always learn something new. So last week we talked about Tony Ducks Corolla, his downfall. Uh, by essentially over expanding and creating problems for himself, but that wasn't the that was only exacerbated uh, by getting caught talking way too openly in his car. The entire commission gets whacked, uh, essentially, uh, <laughs> by the commission case and the dynamic of all of the families would change. While there would be new leadership uh, within the Lucchese crime family, there would be other issues that were pertinent to the timing. Uh, the murder of Paul Castellano uh, precipitated a huge investigation and really put the entire mafia on notice. Uh, that is one aspect that, that I want to cover for just a few minutes because rarely do people mention that that murder in and of itself um, did in the totality of the entire mob. We've talked at length about why John Gotti pulled the hit off, and it comes down to one, we- one word, fear. Okay, a lot of people won't say it, but that's the reality of it. Gotti's options were very limited at the time. On one hand, Paul knew that Gotti knew that his crew was moving drugs, and his closest friend had buried Paul Castellano uh, and other families, uh, and that friend was Angelo Ruggiero. Uh, as long as Neil Del- Della Croce was still alive, Gotti would be alive. Uh, after Neil died, Gotti realized he no longer had a staunch ally within the hierarchy. And it meant that if Paul wanted to, he could. He had a few options on the table. He could kill every single fucking one of them, including Gotti, and he would have been justified in doing that. Uh, he could demand the head of Rogerio on a stake, and he would have been justified in doing that too. He could shelve Gotti and everybody within his crew, and he would have been justified in doing that too. Gotti had, Gotti had little choice but to either wait it out and hope for the best or to act. He chose to act, and the brazen hit caused a massive problem for the mob. Mob hits over the century, you know, they caused problems, but not like this one. Uh, this was uh, in front of innocent people, uh, not in broad daylight, but it might as well have been, and it caused the NYPD and the FBI to step in, and if they ever needed a reason to dismantle the mafia, now that they would have one, 100%, and they would go full, full force to John Gotti, and it was no hidden secret who pulled off the hit. Uh, as the FBI and NYPD knew almost immediately, that Gotti probably pulled the strings. The schism that it caused on the streets was another issue entirely. Uh, Vincent Gigante, who we have discussed, was absolutely fucking irate. Uh, By the rules, Gotti should have been killed for what he did. But Vinny Gigante, I think, just sat back because he knew Gotti had just put a target on himself and the entire Gambino crime family. And rather than react, he would sit back and let Gotti bury himself which is what Gotti would do within four years. Uh, Tony Ducks was also irate over the murder of Paul Castellano, or was he? You know, over the years, it's sort of been stated that just after the hit, Tony Ducks from prison ordered, uh, or excuse me, prior to, go to pri- prior to going to prison, ordered John Gotti's death. I find it incredibly hard to fathom when you consider a couple of things here. Uh, When you consider that Kerala had complained that Paul Castellano was ripping off the other four crime families, you know, that's something to be taken into consideration. Uh, I doubt that he would have gotten involved, especially when you consider the NYPD and the FBI was all over them. It just doesn't make sense for anybody to act aggressive at that point. Uh, I laugh a lot when pundits, because there's all sorts of them on YouTube and in other media outlets, they try to tell me that Kerala or Gigante was behind the attempt to kill Gotti, which killed Frankie DeChico. 
listen, whether you agree with it or not, had Vinny the Chin wanted John Gotti dead, John Gotti would have been fucking killed. 100% make no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Gotti wasn't hard to find. He wasn't unrecognizable. He wasn't in hiding. In fact, I would argue that the surveillance on Gotti probably saved his fucking life multiple times. And that's a fact. And nobody ever seems to mention that. Like, Gotti was one of the most surveilled gangsters in the history of organized crime. And people are very quick to say, well, it was Tony Ducks and Vinny the Chin who wanted the bomb place. They wanted to... Are you crazy? They get, that's the difference between somebody who's, you know, educated versus somebody who knows the streets. You know, you can be the smartest guy in the world, but if you don't understand the streets, then you can't make an, an educated argument against that. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I think it's nonsense, and I don't even think it's accurate. I mean, not even from a street perspective. Things were too hot on the streets, and nobody was about to do anything that soon after Paul Castellano's murder. So in 1986, Tony Ducks tapped Anthony Luongo to be the new boss of the Lucchese crime family, but Luongo would disappear in 1986, and it's widely believed that Vic Amuso was jockeying for position and with the help of Anthony Casso, whacked Anthony Luongo to get him out of the way to take over. Then Corallo would have no choice after that to tap Amuso or Casso, and they would be right. Corallo would make Vic Amuso the next boss of the Lucchese crime family. Amuso had good stock he could earn. He was willing to kill, uh, and he was the former uh, captain of, or he was the captain of Christy Tikfunari's old crew. Uh, you know, there have been stories throughout the years that Corolla actually wanted to to sort of tap Casso to be a boss rather than a Muso, and that Casso was approached and deferred to a Muso. Um, and I think that's probably realistically uh, the way that it happened. Uh, but did it? would it really even fucking matter? Because Amuso would officially become the acting boss of the Lucchese crime family in 1987. And Amuso's first move would be to name Gaspipe Casso underboss. But in reality, they shared the power. Uh, but, in a, but in reality, in a short period of time, Amuso and Casso would go on a bloodthirsty killing spree. And times were about to get really fucked up. Because the duo with Casso and Amuso, as I said last week, was like putting two Nikki Scarfos on the fucking street in South Philadelphia and letting them rape, pillage, and plunder uh, to their heart's content. While there's so much to cover during this period, we're not going to really go in depth with a ton of different things because there's just too much. But we need to highlight things that are important. So just very briefly, because we covered some of this last week, but Vic Amuso was born in Canarsie, Brooklyn in 1934. By most accounts, he was a criminal from day one and wasn't until the 1940s that he meets Tony Ducks Corallo, who at the time was a big capo within the Gagliano crime family. He would eventually become a driver for Carmine Tramonti uh, and then was an earning associate of the family, but he was not a made guy. Later, he would become an enforcer for and a collector for Joey Gallo. In the early 1960s, as Joey Gallo went to war with Joe Profaci, it was Vic Musso who was called upon by Joey Gallo to kill as many members of the Profaci crime family as he could. And he was a very proficient killer. And according to many sources, Amuso was the shooter in several murders that involved the Gallo crew versus the Profacis. Whatever work had to be done for the Gallo uh, wouldn't last as Gallo would take a pinch and he would be sent to prison in the early 60s uh, along with Amuso and a dozen others on extortion charges. Gallo would be released, as we know, in 1971 and goes right back to war against the Colombo crime family, being pushed hard by Carlo Gambino to encroach on Colombo's turf. Uh, we know that that would only last so long because Joey Gallo would get whacked on his 30, 43rd birthday in Little Italy at, uh, inside Umberto's Clam House. It was late in 1971 and, and I think 1972 that Amuso would become associated with the Lucchese crime family again. Uh, most of the spillovers from the Gallo crew went on different went to different families after Gallo was murdered. He would become an on the record associate, and his main capital report to would be Christy Tikfunari, and the headquarters would be the 19th Hole Social Club. Uh, this is where Amuso would meet Gaspipe Casso, and the two would be tutored in the art of dismemberment by Funari. Quickly, Amuso would become an earner for his for the family. On the other end of things, Gaspipe Casso himself was showing signs of being a high end earner too. December twenty first of nineteen seventy two, Vic Amuso gets arrested outside the house of Morgan Avenue, which was a front for the Bronx Connection. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with what the Bronx Connection was, it was basically a, a scheme 
which involved kickbacks. They were essentially selling prison paroles for $20,000 per inmate. Uh, Amusa was actually there to meet with Richard Curro, who was a city corrections officer. And he was an on-the-record uh, Lucchese crime family associate who basically was the go-between the Lucchese crime family and the inmates, the middleman. Uh, at the time of his arrest, Amuso was caught with a file folder of prison documents, which basically just proved he was doing it. Uh, in 1977, Vic Amuso officially is inducted into the Lucchese crime family. May 30th of 1977, Vic Amuso takes another pinch, but this time gets arrested with Anthony Gaspipe Casso. It was their involvement with narcotics trafficking and importing heroin from Bangkok. Uh, they basically had been found with three pounds of heroin in their possession, the operation apparently had been funded by Vic Amuso along with Casso and two other associates within the Lucchese crime family. Amuso would get out in the early 80s and then would hit the streets running again. Uh, Anthony Casso was born in South Brooklyn, New York in 1942. Not a ton is known about, you know, Casso prior to the 16th birthday. Uh, that's when he quit school. Uh, and through his father and his godfather, uh, Salvatore Calimbrano, uh, who was a made guy within the Genovese crime family, gets him a job uh, as a longshoreman. Uh, a lot of people have misreported that his father was fully responsible for that, but that wasn't the case as the union was pretty much shut down at that time, uh, and Calimbrano did Casso a favor. At 16 years old, uh, Gaspipe Casso had no emotional connection to anything and would seriously kill animals uh, for fun. Uh, he had a gun and would run around killing dogs, cats, pigeons, honing his ability to shoot and hit targets. In one such case, uh, he tied up a dog, set him on fire, let him loose, and then trained the gun on the frantic dog running around and hit him in one shot, killing him immediately. So Gaspipe Castle from day one had a, a sick fucking problem. In the 1950s, he ends up joining the South Brooklyn Boys. Now, historically, the South Brooklyn Boys, and you guys can look this up for yourself, were mostly Italian-American gangs that had smaller sets of you know, sort of the greaser types, uh, which were located in Carroll Gardens, Cobble Hill, Park Slope, Red Hook, Borium Hill, uh, and some other gang sets, the Diablos, the Garfield Boys, the Wanderers, the DeGraw Street Boys, the Sackett Street Boys, the Butler Gents, the Gowanus Boys, Kane Street, <laughs> this is a great one, Kane Street Midgets, uh, the Savages, the Testers, the Senators, the Little Gents, and the Young Savages. Uh, today, uh, the South Brooklyn Boys still actually exist in many different forms. They were aligned with the Italian Mob, the Tanglewood Boys, the Ozone Park Boys, and the early form of Joey Gallo's crew. Uh, their rivals would have been the Jokers, uh, the Untouchable Bishops, the Mau Mau's, the Fort Green Chaplains, the West Street Boys, and the Supreme Team. And this is really where Castle learned to hone his skills as a tough guy, a fighter, and somebody who was capable of murder. In 1958, Gaspipe Castle was arrested for a brawl against an Irish gang. His father actually went to go bail him out, and, and he tried to with the cops scare him straight, but it just didn't work as Castle wanted to live a life of crime. And it wasn't long after that that Christy Tikfunari notices Gaspipe Castle. Uh, almost as soon as Castle was brought in, under the tutelage of Funari, Casso begins to loan shark. Uh, he would move his way into gambling and narcotics trafficking. In 1961, he would be arrested for attempted murder, but the witness in this case formed amnesia almost immediately, and probably for good fucking reason. Uh, at in 1974, at age 32, Anthony Casso becomes a made man within the Lucchese crime family. Casso would be sent to... Uh, Vincent Fosseri, who had his own crew, and he would be under Fosseri's crew, which operated out of two different places. They operated at a social club off of 116th Street in Manhattan and also operated out of a social club off 14th Avenue in Brooklyn. Uh, not longer after he becomes a made member uh, within the Lucchese crime family, he forms a close bond to Vic Amuso, the dangerous duo. Uh, the two got along. Uh, they thought along the same lines. They loved money and they loved murder. Uh, it would be a partnership that would last almost 20 years. Not only could they earn on their own and handle business on their own, but together they were a force to be reckoned with. They would sublet themselves out for murder for hire, uh, especially they enjoyed murdering informants or suspected informants because there is nothing the two men hated more, which is very fucking ironic to me considering Gaspipe becomes a fucking rat himself. Uh, within the 19th whole crew, it became a clubhouse for crime and schemes. One of the bigger schemes that Castle and Amuso created was the Bypass Gang. This was a gang that they had it all. They had locksmiths, 
alarm experts, safe crackers, you name it, they had it. And they would begin robbing banks, safety deposit boxes, businesses, jewelry stores, all throughout New York City and Long Island. And this went on for years. Uh, and they were apparently damn good at it because authorities have alleged that they stole over $100 million from smashing grabs, including safety deposit boxes, just between the 1970s and 80s. Like, that's a fucking insane amount of money. Why the fuck would you need to do anything else? Uh, so, Christy Tick Fenari gets promoted to consulier, and he asks Gaspipe Casso to take over his old crew. Casso actually declines, suggesting that Amuso would logically be the next one in line, and that's basically what went down. Uh, in 1985, Casso was approached by Frankie DeChico. Frankie DeChico relays that there is a planned coup within the Gambino crime family. Casso, who had worked with both Gravano and Gotti in, the drug, tra- in drug trafficking, uh, was basically just putting it out there that he had that that they they wanted to get the support of high end capos from different families. In other words, they wanted universal support for what they were about to do. And they, he basically explains they're going to whack Paul Castellano. What Gotti was doing through Frankie was basically looking for backing for other crime families because they don't want a problem. According to Salvatore Sammy, the bull piece of shit, rat lying fuck Gravano, uh, Casso gave his support of the murder of Paul Castellano, which Casso would deny ever happened. Uh, and one of the reasons that Frankie DeChico allegedly offered was the fact that Castellano had allowed his house to be bugged, and that was justifi- justification enough in the streets to murder Paul Castellano. According to Gaspipe Casso, he tried in vain to tell Frankie DeChico it was a bad idea, that you need to go see the commission, you need to get their approval, because if you don't, then and you move on Paul without permission, they're going to kill every single fucking one of you. That's according to Gaspipe Casso. What's the truth? He probably went along with it. I, I would almost guarantee he did. Uh, Castellano would be murdered on December 16th of 1985. And what happens next is going to be a large topic of debate and has been for years. According to Gaspipe Casso and according to authors, Tony Ducks was irate, as was Vincent Gigante. And in return for the murder of Paul, they ordered the deaths of John Gotti, Frankie DeChico, Jeannie Gotti, and anybody they thought that was involved in the murder of Castellano. However, they never ever took a shot at Sammy Gravano either. They don't even mention Sammy Gravano, and please keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, according to Casso, he and Amuso were tasked with handling out the street justice and were instructed to use bombs to throw off the scent uh, that it was another mob family. Rather, what they wanted people to think was that zips from the old country from sicily who were well known to use bombs they wanted to basically make it look like uh sicilians had done it that were related to paul castellano they were angry so they would use bombs and there's there's a few issues with that number one bombs had been banned by the mafia due to the risk of killing innocent people for a long time now people might use that as a reason to actually say well that's probably why they did do that but there is no proof to suggest that that would be accurate at all uh, I don't believe for one second that Amuso or Casso was asked to do anything. I'm going to tell you the truth. It doesn't make any sense for that to be the case. It also makes no fucking sense because Casso was in business with Gravano and drugs. And Gravano at the time was about to be a part of the hierarchy of the Gambino crime family prior to Frankie DeChico getting killed. So why, why was Gravano not killed? Why was Gravano not killed? Because surely he would have had to have been involved in that as well. And remember, he was apparently standing there when Frankie DeChico told Gaspipe what they were going to do. So I, I just find it all hard to believe, to be honest with you. I don't think that Casso nor Amuso were responsible, at least in terms of how it's been described by informants. And let me give you another alternative. Okay. For starters, bombs. Vinny the Chin never would have agreed to that ever under any circumstances. It would have been much easier just to go kill John Gotti or to go to his people and say, listen, you either kill him or all of you are going to be killed. It's that simple. Why on God's earth after Paul Castellano was killed, are you going to use a car bomb? Do you know how stupid that is? Gigante had more power than John Gotti. And with the feds after Gotti for the hit on Castellano, there was just no way they were going <laughs> to going to use a bomb we do know that a bomb was used because frankie de chico was killed in a car bomb on april 13th of 1986 what is known is that gravano lied about pulling frankie de chico out of the car he never did that in fact he left the social club minutes 
after he heard Gotti call in and say he wasn't coming to the social club. Secondary to that, I believe, uh, do I believe that the bomb was designed and planted by the Lucchese crime family? 100% I think that they planted that bomb. But more specifically, Gaspipe Casso had that bomb planted. But it's not for the reason that most people are going to want you to believe. Did you know that Gaspipe Casso was still irate over Angelo Ruggiero? To put it simply, Castle would vow to kill anybody who had anything to do with the attempted murder on himself. Jimmy Heidel, who was Danny Marino's nephew, sh- basically shot Castle a bunch of times and fucked up the hit. The hit was arranged by Angelo Ruggiero. It was over a drug beef. Castle would then use the mafia cop Stephen Caracapa and Louis Eppolito to kidnap Jimmy Heidel and bring him to a warehouse where for days Castle worked him over before finally killing him, but not before Jimmy Heidel gave up Angelo Ruggiero's name. Castle wanted Ruggiero dead. He wanted Gotti dead. He wanted Gene Gotti dead. He wanted anybody in that crew fucking dead. And it was revenge for what Angelo Ruggiero did. There is no fucking way Gotti did not know that Angelo Ruggiero was selling drugs and he tried to kill Gaspipe Casso. There's no way he didn't know about that. What makes this even more conspiratorial is the timing. You have to remember, people who claim this was ordered by Tony Ducks have to ask why Gravano wasn't killed. But Gravano wasn't killed, but Bobby Borriello was. Bobby Borriello had another beef with somebody else with another mobster, and that's what often people say. Well, that was a result of, a, of another beef. But the fact is, Gaspipe Castle had Bobby Borriello killed. What did Gotti do to avenge that? Not a goddamn thing. He did nothing. And think about it for a second. Castle was hell-bent on getting rid of anybody related to John Gotti for what Angelo Ruggiero did, right? He couldn't get near Ruggiero because Ruggiero was under like 10 different fucking indictments. So Casso moved on to anybody related to the hierarchy or related to Ruggiero. It also helped fuel a reason because of the Castellano murder. But once again, I point to why was Gravano allowed to live? He would have been easier to kill than any of them. Why was Frankie Lacasio allowed to live? Why were any of them allowed to live if that's the case? So you mean to tell me they just said, ah, let's just kill Frankie DeChico. That's going to solve all our problems. That's bullshit. That's not how the streets operate. It was a move designed for two reasons. It removed a powerful hierarchical member from the Gambino crime family. It would also push Frankie DeChico out. And that allows Sammy Gravano to step up into the role. Meaning Gravano was complicit and knew about it. Remember, according to Casso, Gravano and DeChico approached him about the murder of Castellano, right? So if we believe all of the pundits and what the informants say, then naturally Gravano would have been killed too. So why is Gravano allowed to live? And it's simple. Casso and Gravano had a drug business together and it helped their business by removing Paul. And it also elevated Gravano to the underboss role at the same time. If Casso was so righteous as people claim or informants have claimed, Gravano would have been killed immediately. Fucking immediately. Removing Frankie DeChico did a lot of things. Gotti lost a lot of power with Frankie DeChico getting killed. But it also benefited Casso and it, it, it alleviated his anger and frustration. Killing Bobby Borriello alleviated some frustration. But it, it puts Gravano in a different situation. It alleviates several things. And I'm never going to claim that Gotti wasn't a dead man walking because I think John Gotti was. I just never, ever bought the car bomb theory. It's too simple by design, to be honest with you. It fits Casso's narrative. You have to remember, Casso was an informant. It fits his narrative to the feds. Remember, informants need to give information, but also keep themselves out of the issue. Dummy down what they did, amplify what everybody else did. This is why I think Casso lied to the feds about how all of it went down and why it went down. You mean to tell me that John Gotti, who was seen everywhere, could be found everywhere, was not able to be killed? Come on. I mean, and yeah, we can argue the surveillance thing. The bomb itself was remote detonated. The process was by pushing the, pushing the bomb underneath the car, then watching, and then hitting the button when whoever you wanted to kill get in range. 
It means the Lucchese's had eye on the club. In fact, they had a social club two blocks down. They had eyes on that club. John Gotti is not somebody you misrecognize under any circumstances. In fact, why, why Gravano was even at Jimmy Brown's club that day is just odd. Everybody that I have talked to that knew about this has said he would have had no business there. Why was, why was it that he left just before the bomb went off? Why did he lie about carrying Frankie's body parts? Simple. Deflection. Who had the most to gain by Frankie going, getting killed? And I don't care what internet know-it-all seems to think. There's zero proof of the stupid zip theory of Sicilians. It's people that say that are relying on words of rats. Plain and simple. Anyway. November of that year, Tony Duck's Corolla goes away forever. Prior to that, Corolla has a Musso and Casso meet him at Christy Tikfunari's house on Staten Island where he transfers power to both of them. And Amuso assumes the role as the new acting boss. Amuso would name Casso the consigliere and Mariano, uh, excuse me, uh, Macaluso the underboss. But Macaluso would step down not long after that and Casso would assume the role of underboss. So with the murder of DiCicco and then Bobby Borriello, John Gotti has plans to go to war with the Lucchese crime family. That is what's going to happen. Gotti had instructed his captains to build up the war chest, and as soon as his trials are over with, they're going to go to war with the Lucchese crime family, and they're going to kill every single fucking one of them because Gotti was pissed. The interesting part about this is this. There are surveillance photos of Gravano with Amuso and Casso during this time period. It means Gravano was meeting with the enemy behind the scenes. Ask yourself why that is. Ask yourself what the hell Gravano was doing with them, considering they, they had killed Frankie DeChico and Bobby Borriello. If this is a family you're preparing to go to war with, what the fuck is your new number two doing there meeting with them? The fact is he was meeting with them over narcotics as Gravano was moving tons of cocaine with Casso and Amuso. Also, why would John Gotti single out only the Lucchese crime family? Why just them? And it's because he knew there was bad blood over the Ruggiero shit. He knew who did it and why they did it. More signs um, that disprove the theory about Zips. In fact, photos of Amuso with Gravano and Casso in Brooklyn tend to make those assertions by Casso years later in a proffer session to be meaningless and a way for him to deny culpability. And those are facts. Amuso and Casso begin to move the family into different rackets. Narcotics would become one of the major operations that they would run. Gambling, extortion, construction rackets, they're all on the table. Casso and Amuso were pulling in fifteen to $20,000 a month just from extorting Long Island carting companies. They were pulling in another 75000 a month in air freight carriers and in return guaranteed labor peace and union benefits for their workers as you can see they simply kept the machine moving in terms of labor racketeering they're stepping in the same lines that tommy lucchese and everybody else have ever done they were bringing in twenty thousand dollars a month from joker poker machine routes two hundred forty five thousand dollars a year from concrete suppliers another two hundred thousand dollars a year from the garment district that doesn't even touch what the drug money was bringing in or what soldiers were bringing into the family so under Casso and Amuso, the family was pulling in millions upon millions a year. What Amuso and Casso did was keep expanding, following the structure set before them. They used their power within labor racketeering to control everything. They got $800,000 from the Columbos for helping rob steel from a job site in the West Side Highway in Manhattan. They got another $600,000 from the Gambinos for allowing them to take over a Lucchese protected contractor for a housing project on Coney Island. Casso, with his power, would even control the Greek mob. He told Greek mob boss George Calic okay, I'm going to say this name wrong, uh, Calicatus, what to do. And he forced him to pay protection in the sum of almost $700,000 a year in protection money. In return, they'd allow him to loan shark, extort, and, and run illegal gambling operations in Astoria. Casso controlled a Greek mob boss. $700,000 a year in protection. <laughs> Amuso and Casso were money makers. They were crafty in how they developed business relationships and business friendships. The fact that a Greek, Greek mob boss, who had largely prior to that acted on his own, was forced to pay up or else. Uh, and Casso, and nobody before Casso had, had ever bullied the Greek mob boss like that. Casso was the first. 
1986, uh, Marit Balagula had an issue. Balagula, who's originally from Orenburg, Russia, had become the leader of the Russian mafia in Brighton Beach, but he only took over in 1986 after the murder of his partner, FZ Agron. Many believe that Balagula had his partner killed and that Balagula's number two, Boris Nafield, carried out that murder. In any event, Balagula had an incredible scheme going on with gasoline tax. Balagula was selling $150 million a month worth of gas. It was pocketing an additional 30 to $40 million in unpaid tax. He wasn't paying his tax. So when the IRS starts to get wise to it and look into it, every time they did, it led back to a fictitious company that didn't exist, a barren address, or a vacant lot. Michael Francis had heard whispers of a gas scam going on, and rather than be a man himself, he sends Frank Sciartino to visit Balagula. Francis, through Sciartino, ordered protection money or else. Balagula could have killed Scortino on the spot, and he had enough power to kill the guy, and nobody probably would have budged. Instead, Balagula basically tells Sciartino to go fuck himself, and he goes to see Casso. He explains the situation to Casso, and Casso says, let's have a sit down, which Balagula agrees to do. The meeting gets set up. Christy Tikfunari is there, Gaspipe Casso is there, and Balagula shows up. Guess who didn't? Michael Francis, the big tough guy who says he invented the gas scam. He doesn't even show up like a bitch. For all his bullshit stories, he was terrified of Christy Tikfunari, and he was terrified of Gaspipe Casso. They ordered Francis to come to the meeting and he refused. He didn't show up. He wasn't afraid to send somebody else to do his dirty work. So for all his stories about he, how he invented the scam, it's all bullshit. How he made millions and millions, it's all bullshit. In fact, Christy Tikfunari put it on the streets that if Francis went near Balagula again, he would be killed. So a deal gets made. And that a percentage of the scam would be kicked back to all of the families. In turn, the Lucchese's would protect Balagula and his businesses. He was told, one person comes near you, go to go see Anthony Casso, and he's going to kill them. All the families would receive two cents per gallon of gas sold. The money that was made from the tax scam would rival that of narcotics trafficking. So all of this shit Francis says is a fucking lie. It would be through Balagula that the Gambinos would begin trafficking in China white from Thailand, coke. They would seal the narcotics in TV sets and would smuggle the drugs through Poland, which was never used before, then into the United States and hand it out or disperse to the five families in New York City. While for Balagula, it was business. As usual, there was a rival who was watching and saw his relationship with the Italians as soft, and he would make his move on Balagula, and his name was Vladimir Reznikov. So when we come back next week, we're going to cap off all of this madness. We're going to talk about Vladimir Reznikov, the issue that there was there. Uh, the murderous mayhem that Castle and Amuso are getting ready to go on. What started as a takeover would become one of the bloodiest times in New York City. From Jump Street, neither Amuso or Castle wanted to deal with problems quietly. Murder was the only way. And while their predecessor, Tony Dux Corolla, loved the New Jersey wing of the Lucchese crime family, Amuso didn't. And they would soon find out the hard way that he didn't appreciate disrespect. We're going to get into the mafia cops, Louis uh, Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa, and everything that they did. And it's going to be an incredible end to the Lucchese crime family. So I hope you all come back for part eight. And for anybody asking the question of, well, why are you going to stop there? Because I pick a time and place that I think is the best place to stop. And it's not because I'm afraid to talk about anybody else. It's not it at all. That's just where we're going to stop. But it's going to be a fucking bumpy roller coaster ride. So as far as the YouTube live, we will announce when the last one is going to be. You've got to check our YouTube for that or go over to Facebook and it'll say last YouTube live. This will be the time and date. I'm not sure when that's going to be. Maybe on Sunday, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I'm not sure because I got to record another podcast tomorrow. So. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed today's show. Uh, I hope those of you that uh, are members keep coming back. It's just going to get better and better and better and better. We've got a lot of cool things planned for the future. We're not slowing down in any way, fashion, or form. 
Uh, and I'm glad you guys hung out with me for a little while today. So have a great weekend, and this is the best way to end this show. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to do the Lucchese Crime Family Part 9, the end. Finally, we've done all five families. Uh, Just so that people understand, uh, there is a large part of today's show where I could have gone a lot further with some things, but I'm not. Uh, Especially when it comes to uh, the Mafia Cops, because that is kind of a show in and of itself. And... I know that uh, throughout the history of covering all of these crime families, we've done a lot of in-depth stuff. I almost said shit, but I don't know why I hesitated on that. Uh, But I didn't cover them exclusively uh, in in this segment of the show because I really wanted to focus on uh, Gaspipe Casso and Vicka Musso. Uh, So if you guys are looking for like a huge dissertation on the Mafia Cops, you're not going to get that here today. Uh, We have talked about the Mafia Cops on multiple other shows, uh, some of them being on YouTube, not specifically, but when we've talked about the the, the history of the crime family. So we're going to cover it a little bit today, uh, and we're going to stop pretty much right around Gaspipe uh, and and Amuso. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I could have gone on and and talked excuse me, about Stephen Crea and all of that, but really you'd just be dumbing uh, sort of it down because the one thing that I hope all of you have learned uh, from this, if you got anything, is comparatively, and I'm sure I'll make this point a dozen times before we're done today, is that you can see how the generation gap, it changes, how traditions change, how men act, how men behave changes. Uh, and there is uh, there is some truth to when guys say that life is over. Now, that, that life is not over. Uh, it's still always going to be here. It's never going to change. But I think when you get 10, 12 generations removed from the founders, I think the principles change. Uh, and that's not to be def- defamatory about anybody, but it's just the reality of it. It's just the reality of it. This day and age, uh, you know, uh, Luciano, if you, can you imagine if he comes back to life and you get one question, you say to him, what do you think about all the rats on YouTube? It would blow his fucking mind. That's just change. Uh, and who knows what it's going to be like, you know, 10 years from now. You know what I mean? It, it, it's it's, it's going to be different. It's going uh, it, to be different. And you guys just heard I got a text. I should... Um, answer this really quick. So hold on one second. All right, sorry about that. These goddamn iPhones, these new ones, like the button on the side to mute shit is like impeccably small. And I have like large, I have big hands. Um, Believe it or not. Okay, turn it off. Believe it or not, I was supposed to be six foot three, but they had to close my growth plates because I broke uh, my ankle and my tibia tibia and fibula playing ice hockey at 15 i got hit looked down my fucking skate was backwards (laughs) and so it was so broke they had to go in and close my growth plates and that was like devastating to any kind of hockey career uh because as it stands i'm about 510 uh but i would have been 6'3 uh because they measure all those things i said well you were going to be 6'3 so what do you mean were you know because believe it or not i had a late growth spurt uh my senior year of high school is five foot seven so I figured, well, I'm going to max out at 5'7". That's it. So I'm going to have to be fast. And I wasn't fast. So I wasn't sure how I was going to play, uh, you know, at a very, very high level, uh, be it national teams, uh, junior Olympic teams and stuff like that. But I went through this growth spurt where I went from like 5'7", 150 to like 5'10", and 220 very quick. Uh, so, you know, it would have been nice to be 6'3", and 220, but it just didn't happen. So... Uh, I have these large basketball hands, and it's just strange when you have large hands and, you know, you're not, like, humongous. So it's like my hands kept growing, but my feet stopped at a 10 and a half. My height stopped at 5'10 and a half or whatever. 
Uh, it is what it is. So anyway, uh, we're going to cover the Lucchese crime family today. Uh, and so last week we talked about uh, Gas Pipe Castle and Vic Amuso jockeying basically for position uh, and the issues between uh, Marat Malagula and how Michael Francis tried in vain to shake him down, but then refused to show up for a meeting to discuss that issue. Uh, at this particular meeting, it was decided that the gas tax scam would be split evenly amongst the families in return for Balagula. Uh, would basically be protected by the Italian mafia, and his point man would be Anthony Gaspipe Casso. So with Tony Ducks off to prison, uh, it would be the rise of Casso and Amuso, and almost immediately there were issues. I mean, like immediately. Uh, in the background, Val Vladimir Reznikov uh, wasn't buying Balagula's re reliance on the Italian mafia. Uh, Reznikov was a stray gangster, uh, and prior to that huge beef, Reznikov actually got along with Balagula, but Balagula made two mistakes with Reznikov. The first one was that he fucked Reznikov over on the gas scam. Uh, and what Balagula had done was he promised Reznikov a part of the action, and then Balagula promised uh, Reznikov um, a, a legal license so that Reznikov could partake in the pilfering of the gas tax scam. The problem was Balagula ripped him off. And he gave him a fake license, and Reznikov was irate uh, because Reznikov would lose like almost a million dollars out of the deal. So he sent word that he wanted the money that he would have made or else. Balagula sends word back that basically he could go fuck himself. <laughs> so between that and then his reliance on the Italians for protection uh, was enough for Reznikov to basically want to cut Balagula's head off. Uh, the problem was is that Balagula was seen in Russian circles uh, as sort of a pussy for, for paying the Italians a cut of any of his action. But Balagula, by nature, was a fucking animal himself, and he had no issues killing anybody. And to him, it was just a matter of proxy of doing business. Reznikov was infuriated that he hadn't been paid, and he ends up storming into a nightclub in little Odessa in Brighton Beach that was owned by Balagula. He ends up pulling out a gun, puts it to his head, and he demands $600,000 or he's going to fucking kill him. Uh, Balagula sort of plays the game and explains that, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get you your money or whatever. It's going to take a few days. Reznikov leaves, and Balagula would end up suffering a heart attack over the issue. It scared the hell out of him. And rather than sit in the hospital, which doctors advised that he do, he went home to Brighton Beach to recover, and he places a call to Gaspipe Castle. <laughs> I can only imagine how that conversation went. Gaspipe finds out what happens, and, and Castle's irate. Uh, the two had grown close, and Castle wasn't about to allow anybody to fuck with their money or Balagula. He tells Balagula to send word to Reznikov that his money would be ready and that he needed to come the following day and pick it up at the, the nightclub. In the meantime, Gaspipe Casso places a call to Anthony Center and Joey Testa, who had begun to come around the Lucchese crime family more and more. And the reason why Casso even took them in to begin with, and a lot of people don't talk about this, was for several reasons. Uh, the first was because they were essentially serial killers uh, who could be counted on to commit murder. But most importantly, they had access to Roy DeMeo's son, Albert who they believed had Roy's black book, which contained all the loan sharking records, which was in the millions, and it was uncollected debt. Uh, and they had promised Gaspipe Casso the book in return for getting made within the Lucchese crime family. Whether or not Casso had any intention ever of holding to that deal or not really doesn't matter. Casso wanted the book, and he wanted to collect all the money that was owed to DeMeo. Anthony Center and Joey Testa repeatedly tried to intimidate Albert DeMeo. It didn't work. And when that didn't work, they tried to kill him twice. And that didn't work. Uh, and to my knowledge, they never, ever got their hands on that book. Uh, from what I understand, you're going to love this. Guess who did get that book? Gravano. Schmeagel. Anyway, uh, Gaspipe calls Anthony Center and Joey Testa, and he basically tells them the problem that they have with Reznikov. The following day, Reznikov enters the little Odessa uh, nightclub, and he ends up getting shot in the back of the head by Joey Testa, and then Anthony Center finishes him off. Uh, I believe that Anthony Center used an AK-47 <laughs> to finish him off. It's a little uh, overkill, but... Uh, Balagula after that day would never have a problem with the Russians again. And he, and, and what that does is a couple things. It sends word to anybody on the streets. If they thought they were going to fuck with him or his operation, what the cost would be. So not long after the Balagula situation, there arose another situation. 
Uh, Vic Amuso, who basically stepped in as sort of the boss, but him and Gaspipe sort of shared the reins. Uh, he began to demand from other crews, especially the New Jersey wing of the Lucchese crime family, that they kick up 50% of their criminal profits in New Jersey. Uh, Capo Anthony Astero and Mike Takeda refused. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, I don't know what the percentage was under Corolla, but I doubt it was as high as 50%. Uh, one thing that Corolla wasn't was a penny pincher. Uh, he was getting a boatload from the New Jersey guys uh, and was beyond satisfied with those numbers. Remember, it was Tony Ducks Corolla who pushed into New Jersey. Amuso didn't see it that way, and making that type of demand was something that was not going to be met with smiles and handshakes. But at the same time, if he's the acting boss, you have to do what he says, or you're going to get killed or you're going to go to war. Uh, according to what I've been able to find out, they were basically giving a Muso fifty thousand dollars a year, which is peanuts. That's nothing. If they're making, you know, fifty, please, they're probably making fifty grand a month. So he had a right to be pissed. But when the money stopped, um, he just was fed up with it. And the order, the official order that he gives is whack Jersey, kill all of them. Uh, a Muso wanted them all fucking dead. <laughs> So what Amuso does is he summons the entire crew from Jersey to Brooklyn for a meeting. The crew wasn't stupid, and they realized that it was likely a setup, and they were going to get murdered, so they didn't show up. And instead, they loaded up with weapons and went into hiding. After that, Castle and Amuso would be implicated for the Windows case. From 1978 till 1994, the five families of the New York Mafia, including the Lucchese crime family, were basically bid rigging for the installation of Windows in the city. The bids were rigged to 75% of $191 million or $142 million uh, of the window contract awards by the New York Housing Authority. Union-provided companies were per required to make union payments between $1 and $2 per window. Because of this, Amuso and Casso drifted off the radar to avoid prosecution and prying eyes. So in other words, you could, they, they didn't go into hiding, but they were just not seen a whole lot. Uh, what they would do then was officially name Alphonse Diarco the street boss. Uh, and the next few years would be atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> as Castle and Amuso would begin killing anybody they suspected of anything. Uh, anything comes up, just fucking kill them. Uh, don't hesitate. The problem that it began to exhibit for the Lucchese crime family was that Amuso and Casso had gone off the reservation and pretty much everybody was terrified. Like I said before, think of this in terms of two Nikki Scarfos in South Philadelphia in the 1990s. <laughs> These guys had no reason, no rhyme. They just killed. Uh, they killed people, which led a lot of street guys to wonder if they had become mentally fucking insane. Officially, on May 30th of 1990, Gaspipe Castle and Vic Amuso were indicted in the Windows case. And any idea that they had been seen visibly in a while well, now it's now they're going to go on the lam. Uh, with the indictment they, they thought was coming, finally does. They said, fuck this, we're getting out of the way. In 1991, Fat Pete Chiodo was indicted on a RICO case. Amuso feared that he was going to become a rat, and he sent word, kill Pete Chiodo. On May 9th of 1991, three gunmen shot Chiodo 12 times. And Chiodo didn't fucking die. A few weeks later, Amuso sent word to Chiodo's attorney that Chiodo's wife was going to be killed. Weeks later, Chiodo's sister ends up getting nearly shot to death. So a lot of times, people bring this specific incident up, and, and, and I want to be really specific. The rule is, albeit to my understanding, that women and children are not to be harmed, and that has been a rule since 1930. You just don't do stuff like that. It's against everything. And sometimes people will say to me, well, how the hell can you blame Pete Chiodo for becoming a rat after they were going to kill his wife and shot his sister? Well, listen, you join that life. You understand the rules. You understand what can happen. Now, granted, what Amuso did is, is fucking repulsive and disgusting, and it should have gotten him killed. Somebody should have stepped up and said, we're not going to tolerate it, and he should have been killed. But Chiodo did have options. Whether you agree with me or not, ratting is not the way to go. For all the murders that Castle and Amuso would order out of fear of people e even thinking of ratting, they actually were forcing guys to become cooperators with their bloodletting. So in other words, they were so feared and they were so destructive the guys who would never even fucking rat decided to do it because they were petrified. Uh, guys were not given a lot of alternatives. 
But I would also say there is always an alternative. So one of the arguments that people always make with me is, well, how can you blame Pete Chioda for doing what he did because of what they did? Well, there's options. Remember I said that. So Amuso is pissed that Chioda was still alive. Uh, and then what he does <laughs> is he comprises a list of 49 people he wants fucking dead which included Al Diarco, who is the acting boss, who Amuso blamed solely for not getting the murder of Pete Chiotto done right. Amuso orders the death of Diarco, and then the alleged hit was supposed to take place at a hotel in Manhattan. As Diarco arrives at the hotel, he spots somebody he recognizes, and he sees them hide a gun in their shirt, and he sees them go to the bathroom. Diarco is not a fucking moron. He knows what this is. And so what he what does he do? He gets up, turns around, walks out the door, and right into the arms of the federal government. <laughs> so once again, Amuso's actions begin to push people to become informants. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm just explaining to you the way it is. Next on the hit list for the Lucchese was Stephen Crea, who was the acting under boss in the Bronx, and John Gotti Jr., who was on an acting panel in the Gambino crime family. It's been alleged that Frank Lostarino, George Zappola, George Conte, Frank uh, Papani, and Frank Joe were ordered to take out the hits on Korea and John Gotti Jr. It's been speculated that the murders were ordered in tandem with the Genovese crime family. However, I don't believe any of that. Uh, I think this was more bloodletting from Amuso and Casso than anything else i've always told you and i firmly believe that casso always tries to put the genovese crime family in with things to lay off responsibility this is the truth now john Gotti jr for example was not respected by anybody within the mafia okay he was not even actually the boss of the gambino crime family those are all distortions of reality the reality is that uh john Gotti jr was on a panel he had no decisions to make on his own uh, and he was not really well liked by people in the mafia, and he really wasn't well liked by people within the Gambino crime family. And those are just facts, okay? I'm not saying I didn't like him, so therefore everybody else. They just didn't like him, and a lot of people didn't because they thought that he was entitled. They thought that he got his position only because of his father and because he had an ego. Uh, I wasn't there. I can't be totally sure, but I know that the majority of people I've ever talked to about the situation have said the same thing. That, more or less, not a lot of people liked him. And that's okay. Not a lot of people like a lot of people. It doesn't mean he was a dummy. It doesn't mean he wasn't smart. It just means that he universally wasn't accepted. Uh, Vinny the Chinjagante refused to even recognize him on a panel. So, uh, but because of sweeping indictments, those two murders could not be carried out. So we have to go back a little bit to 1985. Uh, and we have to take a little step back. Uh, obviously, we know Gaspipe Casso had two cops on the payroll. Those two cops would have been Stephen Caracapa and Louis Epolito. Over the years, Casso had used both men and paid them over $400,000 in murder contracts and other little tidbits and things that they did. Uh, it was after the attempted hit on Gaspipe Casso by Jimmy Heidel, who was the nephew of Gambino Captain Danny Marino, hired by Angelo Ruggiero, that Casso began to use the, what I like to call, dynamic duo. Uh, Louis Eppolito, by all accounts, prior to Gaspipe Castle, was a good cop, a highly decorated cop. Uh, one of the problems that Louis Eppolito had initially had in becoming a cop was because of his lineage. His uncles and his cousins were all made men within the Gambino crime family, and they were within Nino Gaggi's crew. Now, if you remember, we talked about the Eppolitos in the Gambino crime family and Nino Gaggi having them killed by Paul Castellano. So if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, go back over to the Gambino crime family and listen to that story and you'll hear it again. So his uncle and his cousins were, like I said, eventually murdered by Nino Gaggi. And we discussed that in the DeMeo crew show also as well, which can be on, which you can hear on YouTube as well. We talked about that as well. Uh, Castellano gave Nino Gaggi permission to kill them over some crazy assertions. And basically the short version of that is that Gaggi owed them money. He refused to pay and that what they what the Epolitos did in response to that was put gossip on the street and they laid claims that Nino Gaggi was involved in porn, which he was, which he tried to deny, and drugs, which would create a problem. He was pissed off. He goes to Castellano. He explains the situation. Castellano says, what do you want from me? Kill him. And that's what happened. 
So in 1969, when Louis Eppolito applies to become a cop, he lies on his entrance paperwork and he states that he was unrelated to anybody involved in organized crime, which we now know was a lie. In 1977, Louis Eppolito becomes a detective first grade within the NYPD. The job brought him many accolades, many headlines. In 1983, he was accused of handing over intelligence reports to Rosario Gambino, who was the cousin to Paul Castellano and Carlo Gambino, and he was running a vast narcotics operation in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is why we talk about the Cherry Hill Gambinos. So there you go with that. Once again, go to the Gambino portion of our podcast, Five Families, and you can listen to all about that stuff there. Uh, So there was enough proof that Louis Eppolito did in fact hand those intelligence reports over But the boys in blue have always stuck together, and he seemed to escape those allegations relatively unscathed. The allegations of Eppolito and Caracapa, uh, those rumors began in the mid-1980s, especially when Caracapa was the head of the organized crime homicide unit, which was a part of the major case squad based in Brooklyn. Uh, It was alleged and suspected that even back then that their methods were unrealistic, and somehow they always managed to solve a crime with little to no evidence, like Evidence and proof just dropped out of the fucking sky. Uh, And really what we know is, is that they were getting intel from Casso about things. They were giving intel on uh, investigations and other things, which allowed the mafia to sort of uh, avoid being taped. It avoided, they were able to avoid murder investigations. They were able to avoid really everything. Uh, And that's what made them so valuable. Uh, The fact is, is that Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa had become moonlighting hitmen, information getters, and information givers, and the Lucchese crime family was exceeding because of them. Now, back to the Heidel thing. It was Eppolito and Caracapa who were able to track down Jimmy Heidel. They are the ones who delivered Heidel to Casso, who was hell-bent on retribution, and he ends up torturing Heidel for days and days and days before Heidel finally gives up the fact that Angelo Rogerio had paid him to do what he tried to do, which was kill Casso. That was the first time, allegedly, that Eppolito and Caracapa handed over a suspect, but it wouldn't be the last. Uh, and because it worked so well, uh, Casso put them on the payroll. Next up would be Bruno Facciolo, who Casso thought was snitching. The one thing with Casso that everybody needs to understand, if he had a fucking dream uh, that somebody was snitching, he'd kill him. That's just the way that he was. Uh, Eppolito and Caracapa handled the hit uh, with Louis uh, de Dion and his body, when his body was found, they found a canary stuffed in his mouth, which is a sign of he talked. Caracapa and Eppolito would go on to murder Nicky Guido, the wrong Nicky Guido, Eddie Wino, John Heidel, John Doe, Anthony uh, Delapi, Bruno Facciolo, Bobby Borriello. And then there was a conspiracy that they even wanted to kill Salvatore Gravano at one point. That's going to be a big thing. Uh, There was no telling how many people that Eppolito and Caracapa killed, and I suspect it's probably more than the eight that they would eventually get convicted for in 2009, which they would receive life plus 100 years. Both would die in prison. What is interesting about the Gravano thing, uh, and and I don't want to divulge too much here, and and yeah, while I know you guys all wanted a huge Eppolito and Caracapa thing, I just don't want to give them much time, and there's books you can read, and we talked about it on other shows, and there's files you can access online, uh, it's just that we've talked about it a million times. I don't want to regurgitate it, but uh, Gravano, just to be clear, for a fact, dealt drugs with Gaspipe Casso and Vicamuso. He's denied that, but I have DEA reports and I have 302s and I have the, the Conti letter, which talks way more about Gravano and drugs and his complicity with Casso than a lot of people would ever fucking know. Uh, I also have court transcripts between John Gotti and and Sammy Gravano from Wiretaps. So the fact that Gravano has, you know, relied, lied repeatedly on YouTube saying he was never caught on Wiretaps uh, isn't true. He's he's lying his little rat face off. So after Frankie DeChico got killed, John Gotti was well aware that the Lucchese's could possibly be behind it. And now because of the timing of Tony Ducks heading to prison uh, versus Casso uh, taking over, Uh, He likely probably never suspected that Gaspipe Castle was completely behind that on his own. Bobby Borriello uh, gets clipped outside of his home on orders of Gaspipe Castle, and the hit was done by Frank Lastarino. Uh, Many say it was in regards to the issue with Gotti killing Castellano, but that's really not the case, as Gotti was already in jail. 
Uh, Gotti was absolutely irate over Bobby Borrello getting killed, and he was primed for war with the Lucchese family, but he was primed for war prior to that with them. Uh, and that goes back to after Frankie DeChico got killed, Gotti wanted to go to war with the Lucchese crime family, but he had to bide his time because he had trials coming up. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think he knew specifically that Gaspipe Casso was behind pulling those strings. Uh, and it's worth noting that John Gotti Jr. was ordered to avenge Bobby Borrello's death, and he did absolutely nothing about it. I mean, nothing. So at the time of Frankie's death, or, or shortly thereafter, Gotti was hell-bent on going to war with the Lucchese crime family, but one has to wonder, with all of that bad blood, and the reason why he didn't was because he had trials coming up, and he said, once we get past these trials, we're going to war with the Lucchese crime family. Uh, and, and so you have to ask yourself this, why are there photos of Sammy Gravano meeting secretly before and then after the Chico murder with Vic Amuso and Gaspipe Casso? Uh, why is that? If, if your boss is saying you're going to go to war with these fucking people, what are you doing talking to them? And there's a reason for it. And we know the reason for it. And wait until the documentary drops. You're, you're not going to believe it. So, uh, as we know, Castle and Amuso have taken themselves off the streets and have been ordering murders left and right against anybody who poses a fucking problem. July 29th of 1991, both Castle and Amuso are in hiding for the most part, calling the shots from the Poconos and, and Scranton, PA and, and various places. The FBI ends up tracking down Vic Amuso in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Two years later, two years later, they catch Casso in Mount Olive, New Jersey. So Amuso gets arrested. He's wanted and indicted for all a slew of fucking crimes. And he's offered a, he's offered a rat deal by the government, uh, in which, according to Amuso, he refused to accept under any, any, any circumstance whatsoever. What is interesting in this particular case is that nobody really knew where Amuso was but Gaspipe Casso. And they had a very sophisticated and a very unique system for talking on the telephone that would sort of keep them off the radar. So Casso's the only one who knew where Vic Amuso was. And so how does Amuso get arrested? How does he get found? He was arrested at a fucking mall. <laughs> uh, Amuso is charged and indicted with 54 crimes, including murder, racketeering, uh, and then because he tried to kill Al Diarco and because he tried to kill Fat Pete Chiodo, uh, they've turned state's evidence or government informants. And so Amuso really never stood a chance. He ends up getting hammered with life without parole. And one of the things Amuso begins to suspect immediately is he goes back to the phone call system that he had set up with himself and Gaspite Casso. And he begins to believe that Casso is likely wanting to take over the family for himself, and so he believes that Gaspipe gave information to the fucking feds. <laughs> Let me just say one thing. Vic Amuso is a nutcase. Complete and utter fucking nutcase. That's what I believe. I, I think Gaspipe was too, but he has a lot of delusions. I think he was almost worse than Gaspipe in many uh, sort of respects. So because of this, Amuso... While he's in prison, he strips Gaspipe Casso of his rank and basically shelves him, throws him out of the mafia. Casso himself was looking at a bevy of charges, and because uh, Amuso is making these assertions in the can, Casso decides to become a federal informant. Uh, he not only gave up murders, but he, en he ends up giving up the mob cops, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa. Casso would become an informant, and he basically buries everybody. While Casso had a deal that was set with the federal government, he repeatedly kept speaking out against Salvatore Gravano, admitting that they were drug dealers together, which went against what the government was saying in the United States of America versus John Gotti case. It meant that Gravano was lying on the stand or would lie, and the government couldn't have that, and they eventually tore up his agreement. Uh, Casso would die last year in prison of COVID-19. Uh, if you have never seen the interview between Ed Bragley and Gaspipe Castle, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. Go watch that interview. Anyway, with Amuso in jail and Gaspipe doing what he did, uh, it wouldn't stop Amuso from trying to control the family. He would promote Joe DeFady to acting boss. DeFady was a money-making machine who oversaw the garment district, which was pulling in 40 to 60 grand a month. 
uh, DeFetti would then put Stephen Crea in charge of labor construction and labor racketeering operations. The one thing that's been alleged about Stephen Crea was that he had an ability to understand the construction rackets and take a $300,000 profit every year and turn it over to over a half a million dollar profit for the family. So in other words, he absorbs the racket and makes it more profitable. Through the 90s, Amuso would continue to run the family, and he left DeFetti and Crea to handle the rackets. And so there we go. More nut job shit from Amuso. In 1998, DeFetti would be arrested on charges and charged on nine counts of racketeering. DeFetti would plead out, and he was sentenced to five years in prison. Amuso was so pissed off that DeFetti pled guilty. He ended up promoting Stephen Crea as the new acting boss, street level boss. As fate would have it, Amuso began to suspect that DeFetti was skimming and ordered his murder in 1999 from the can. So he orders his murder in 99 for two reasons. He thought he was skimming. And number two, he pled guilty to something. That was like a mark of death. But that wouldn't work out either as Amuso eventually would threaten to kill Korea and his entire fucking crew. <laughs> Are you seeing a fucking pattern here? <laughs> I think Amuso may have been more dangerous than fucking Nicky Scarfo, to be honest with you. And so that's where we're going to stop with this. I could have continued to go on and we could have talked about the, the Korea case and all of that, but I want to stop here because uh, for a lot of reasons. To me, when you look at the totality of a family, historically speaking, guys like Stephen Korea are nothing in comparison to historical guys. These are new versions, sloppier versions of the past. It's not a knock against Korea because everything I've ever been told was he's a bright guy, good guy, but I'm talking in terms of history. In comparison, you cannot compare them fairly as times have changed. But you see, as Amuso takes over, what begins to happen? His ego, his anger, his delusions sort of placate and destroy the entire family. This is not the family that Tommy Lucchese envisioned. Not even Tony Ducks, as smart as he was, he eventually hurt himself, and that began the downward spiral fray of the Lucchese crime family. I always find it amazing that when we look back in time and we study these men, uh, many of them who were in and of themselves brilliant to some degree or another, the one thing that stretches across the board with many of them is the ones that are not greedy are the one the ones who don't overexpand are the ones and the ones who make slight adjustments are the ones that truly succeed in that life. You can see what Vito Genovese did wrong. You can see where Corolla went wrong. And in contrast, you can see how where Tommy Gagliano took it and then where Lucchese took it and how it worked. It wasn't a new boss coming in and changing everything. It was just a new boss who learned from the old one and just complemented the structure. Guys who come in barbaric and who want to make everything personalized. Take John Gotti, for example. He wanted it his way. And he didn't run the Gambinos like a family, but more like a club. And look at those results. If we can learn anything, it's how to operate it, how to handle it. There are mobsters who are businessmen those who aren't, you know, those who, who, uh, who fail in comparison. You cannot learn any positive attributes from, say, 1999 on. These guys who crafted the mob, the guys who ran it like a business, made business-like decisions. Gambino, Costello, Lucchese, Gambino, Gigante. These are men that survived. Meyer Lansky. There is a lesson in understanding the differences. And I hope throughout the whole entire series of the five families, you have learned something of value. If I have taught you anything, it's this. There is a reason why the boys say the good old days. It's not a reference to less cops. It's not a reference to less drama. It's a reference to when men, men like Gambino, Gigante, even Genovese to an extent, they had scruples. It was about business and money. But you look at guys like Nicky Scarfo, Vic Amuso, Gaspipe Casso, John Gotti. Well, they too were businessmen to some extent because nobody can knock Casso and Amuso's earning abilities. But they allowed their egos to control their inept decisions. 
That's the difference. They put themselves first, not the family. That is the difference. And when we talk about tradition, I just want to make one more final point. This day and age, you have mob guys, made guys hanging out with informants, saying hello to them. Do you think Lucky Luciano would have ever done that? Do you think John Gotti ever would have done that? The evolution of the mob, the mob at its core will always be a certain kind of thing, but the evolution has changed. The days of growing up in New York, coming over from Italy, having 10 siblings, having to take care of them, doing what you had to do to survive, ensuring that future generations never had to struggle like you. These older generation never wanted their children involved. It was all about, I'm going to do what I got to do so my future never has to struggle like I did. And yes, it's a choice. But times were different. Jobs were harder to get. Ethnicities predetermined what you could do and what you couldn't. They did predetermined your wages. Time was different. Today's 40-year-old gangster doesn't understand what it's like to grow up hard. To not have. That's not a knock on them. But when something evolves and sort of like an ember burns, but it doesn't burn with oxygen, it burns with ego. That's where you have the problem. That's why things change. The mob is always going to be here. Everybody says, oh, the mob's died out. It hasn't and it won't. But like history, it always repeats itself. And so if the mob curtails some of the stuff they do, eventually we're going to see it come back to the foundation. And that's what's important. So good, bad, and indifferent. I hope all of you enjoyed the, the, the five families. And I know some of you wanted me to push a little further, but I only go so far.